Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so let me uh, have uh, some very brief introduction to our uh, speakers. Um, Professor uh, Sidney Fells and also John Lloyd, they travel all the way from UBC from Vancouver to come here to give us uh, this talk on articulate synthesis in terms of uh, detailed biomechanical modeling. And this area has been uh, um, up and down over the last 30 some years. Um, I think just recently, uh, we uh, one of the reasons I got interested in this was be, uh, during my uh, sabbatical several years ago, um, you know, at ATR actually, we actually worked with on this approach for a while before I joined Microsoft at the time. And uh, it's a lot of computational complexity in this kind of modeling. And then uh, many people decided, you know, probably just give up on this kind of approach because uh, concatenating the synthesis has played so much important role and it's so easy to construct. Um, and you know, people, a lot of people like um, like this UBC group, and, and uh, there are a couple of other group in the world still are uh, persistently pursuing this kind of approach. Uh, they actually want to solve fundamentally what speech synthesis problem is about. Um, and um, and one of the reasons I brought them in here is because uh, I think two months ago we actually have this uh, multimedia signal processing workshop uh, in Victoria. Um, we actually have the invited uh, speaker on facial modeling using. Um, um, physical based approaches. Um, so this is very very much in parallel with articulate synthesis work. Um, and the, the quality that they produce uh, has been so dramatically improved over the last three or four years. And thanks to you know Moore's law or, or whatever uh, advancement in, in computing technology. So uh, everybody was so much impressed by this. And we, there are a lot of discussions because the speech people and multimedia, um, you know, image uh, analysis and processing people. So we got together. We feel that uh, in speech, um, in speech research, we probably should come back to revisit this approach because this actually is very fundamental. Now, many years ago, the computing facility isn't good enough, but so far, um, you know, so much progress has been made. So we really need to come back to to re-examine uh, this approach. So we actually have some uh, very interesting discussions among a few people, like Larry Robina was there, um, Mary Austin Duff there. We actually have some very interesting discussion on that. So this time, uh, there was um, this speech production workshop in Brazil about two, <coughs> week, two uh, three weeks ago. December. December. Yeah, mid-December. And then one of my collaborators uh, uh, that, that was in Japan when I worked with him on this approach about, about 10 years ago, and he actually told me that uh, you, you really should look at this approach because this is the first time they can see that it's almost real time you know, in Malaysia. So with, I thought that one well, is probably the best opportunity to invite them. So they both uh, have been working uh, on this um, approach for the last three or four years. You yeah. got a strategic grant on Canadian system. They got this very blue sky kind of research. <laughs> Whereas in the US, it's virtually impossible to find this kind of work. So I thought that we really should bring them in to give uh, some introduction Perhaps not to the completely approach. Completely blue sky. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll give <laughs> the floor to Professor Fels and, uh, yeah. and Lloyd. Okay, thanks very much, Lee. And thank you very much for inviting us uh, to come and talk to to um, your group and people at MSR. Um, as Lee was saying, um, back, in, back when we first started, uh, there was this idea that for speech synthesis to progress, it really does need to go back to the fundamentals and think about you know, what is the physiology, what are the mechanisms behind the control of speech. Um, and rather than looking at it strictly as an acoustic waveform or as a uh, uh, spectral phenomenon. Uh, and so that led us to, and, and we also had a recognition at the time that um, computational speeds had increased sufficiently to support uh, investigation of, of complex computational models. Medical imaging had, has advanced to the point where we have a fairly good idea of what the dynamics, though not 100%, but in good enough so that we can actually um, derive these models from, uh, from data. And we also have new techniques for doing physically based modeling that are more efficient and provide better models. So all these, all these factors are coming together at the right time, we believe, to revisit that issue of looking at um, 
articulatory, uh, 3D articulatory speech synthesis. So that's what this project is all about, and we're going to show you where we are at at this point. Um, just to give you a little uh, upfront notice that. Oh, well, we're going to be running demos on this screen, PowerPoint on that screen. <laughs> so, uh, because the demos go with the PowerPoint, and unfortunately, uh, we got here and these screens are rather far apart. Um, though, actually, if the person running the um, screen could put PowerPoint on here for now, and then we'll. Like oh, I think you, you can switch just, it. Just switch it up. Yeah, just uh, switch it at the source there, just to put the PowerPoint on for a moment here. And then when we run the demos, we will um, switch back, and hopefully it's all working. Sure. So let's try that, and then when the demos run, we'll switch to PowerPoint there. Let's see what happens. <laughs> What's the worst thing? I'm gonna, happen? I'm gonna do a lot of walking back and forth. I think. Yeah. Uh, okay. So. Um, um, where were we here? Okay, so what, oh yeah, so just a little <coughs> advance warning. Um, at this point, uh, we've, most of our effort has gone into the biomechanical modeling to get the uh, articulation and the, um, the physiology and the anatomy working um, fairly well and in, um, in, in a timely fashion and working fairly fast. Uh, and we have coupled the acoustics and the sound parts to it, but um, that had to wait until we got up to the point where the physiology is, or the anatomy is correct. Uh, so we're just at that transition stage now where we can focus more time on the, on the acoustics. So I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. So our original goal is um, to create a 3D articulatory speech synthesizer, as I mentioned before. But we also have a bigger goal, bigger goal than that, um, in that we and to achieve this, the belief is that it's so complex that not a single group can probably achieve this goal. And so to do this, we believe in making this uh, toolkit for bringing together different expertise and uh, different models into the same framework so that they can work together so that we can prove and compare different models and incrementally continue to, to expand knowledge to the point where this will all work. And therefore, we couldn't just say our team is going to do everything, rather our team will lay down a framework that others can contribute. And we'll see examples of how that is starting to work and, and the payoff that's available for that. Um, it's open source, um, so again, to support the collaboration, thinking that uh, the scale of the project is too big for a single group. So it's open, and everything you see here today, you can download and try it out yourself. Um, the other, other recognition we had is that... Um, it's, a, it's quite an interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary endeavor incorporating researchers from, um, from outside engineering who are not programmers, um, but bring to the problem a lot of knowledge about speech phenomenon as well as articulation. Um, and so they, um, they definitely are not programmers. So the whole framework has an interactive simulation so that you can experiment and play with it at more of a... Um, uh, an empiricist point of view, and not have to program as much. And it's, it, that's helpful for everyone, but sp especially helpful for people who are not programmers. So you'll see that in action as well. And as we build up models and add them to, to the, with the toolkit, that forms a baseline set. So eventually we'll have an entire set that covers the whole vocal tract, and those will be components that you can switch in and out in different ways to compare them again to to help with an incremental approach to um, in, uh, adding knowledge to solve this very difficult problem of 3D articulatory speech synthesis. So that's, that's our underlying goal. Um, with respect to 3D articulatory synthesis, I already sort of mentioned that, do believe that it really is the next generation of speech synthesis. It really is where it all started, actually, way back when. And I'll show you some history of that, um, of where people doing speech synthesis believed that without an understanding of how humans do it, we won't have good speech synthesis. Of course, uh, along the way with spectral-based spectral methods like formant synthesis, time-based methods uh, like concatenative synthesis, so using the waveform, those have all been very, very successful. 
However, they have limitations in terms of their usefulness for modeling many different um, speakers, uh, modeling uh, emotions, uh, doing audiovisual matching, so for talking heads, uh, so that the speech, um, the signal, the sound is matched to the visuals. And if you don't get that, uh, it does tend to reduce intelligibility. Uh, developing a better understanding of speech production, just from the point of view of, um, of science, just having better understanding of the production mechanisms. And we do believe that having a better understanding of that will improve recognition. That is, part of the challenge of recognition is getting the representation right um, so that uh, it, it's fairly easy to recognize. And going to articulatory synthesis, not only do you get lower bandwidths, but presumably you're in a better space to do recognition due to the continuity and, the, and having a forward model of the speech. Um, and then another one, uh, an offshoot of that, is the, the anatomical structures and understanding it from a physiological point of view. And that, that is great for speech synthesis, but it's actually also good for any understanding of, say, medical conditions of the, of the vocal tract for, like, dysphagia and uh, uh, obstructive sleep apnea or, are typical examples of some of the problems here, and having understanding of these helps. So all this comes together. Um, so I say the past approach is this really articulatory synthesis was the traditional method, um, and we got um, other techniques along the way, but they've, I believe, have le reached some of their limits. So just for fun, I kind of compiled some of the past approaches, the mechanical, past mechanical approaches back in 1770 with the uh, Kranzenstein resonators um, were developed to mimic human sounds, uh, human vowel sounds. And then there's von Kempelen's uh, uh, bellows and leather resonator uh, that you could control with your hand and pump the resonator and it had a few uh, whistles and things to make some of the frication sounds. Uh, and that was, uh, that's considerably uh, older than now, so 1791. And Joseph Faber's talking machine uh, was built, and that was a hand-actuated thing that would move, the, uh, move this mechanical face and uh, produce sound coming through the face. Um, the, uh, actually, Alexander Graham Bell's uh, father, uh, I think, saw this and took, the, uh, took his sons to that which apparently had quite an impact on their, uh, their development afterwards. This, this device was shown around in like circus shows and that kind of thing around the, uh, around, those are the days before TV, I guess. And then, uh, or the web. Uh, and then Alexander Graham Bell and Melville Bell, they built actually a little articulatory synthesizer really just using a human skull and making this sort of rubbery tongue thing and they could blow through a tube to get the excitation and they could mod modulate it that way. So. Um, so we're in good company, though, of course, nowadays we want to build a uh, computational model of all these uh, mechanisms. Though there still is work in mechanical. If you look at Waseda University, um, it's uh, um, uh, Honda, Honda, Masaki, Masaki Honda's uh, work. They also are still building a mechanical voice synthesizer which is quite amazing robotic device if anyone ever gets a chance to see that. Um, but we're going computational. So with the computational models, where we're at today, what's the typical approaches are um, uh, effectively using normally a 2D source filter model of speech where the source is a model of the, um, of the um, vocal cords, typically a two math model, uh, so two coupled oscillating masses. Uh, and the filter is the air, the, the rec is derived from the air passage uh, formed within your, your vocal tract, converted into an area function. So a one dimensional, essentially down to a one dimensional area function that you can get a filter from. Uh, and then there's models of, well, what are the tongue doing, the jaw doing, and two dimensional, mid-sagittal view. And by manipulating that, you get back to this area function, and this area function derives a filter, and that gets excited by this simple model of the vocal tract, and uh, vocal cords, and that is the typical articulatory synthesizers today. 
So, um, so the two mass model was done back in 1972. It's still very popular, but there's other ones besides that. So Rosenberg waveforms are the typical models of glottal excitation. Uh, filter models, the typical one is derived from Kelly Lockbaum um, back in 62, which uh, there's different ways of looking at it, but think of it as a, a series of um, tubes connected together of different area functions, of, of different areas, and that gives you an area function and a resonant chamber, and if you put sound into that thing, it'll have a certain resonant quality. Uh, and so this picture down below here, well, I don't have the pointer thing, but this picture down below um, shows kind of a representation of those cylinders all combined together. Um, Mermelstein, as well as Coker, they developed uh, the mid-sagittal view, so a number of control parameters that represent tongue and jaw and lips that effectively uh, come, in the end, um, extract these area functions so that you can hear what the sound would, so you can move a, a tongue around or a parameterization okay, so of the tongue. So you describe the source, you didn't even talk about the source, so you know, vocal cords. Vocal cords, so, oh yes. Uh, that was kind of traditional view uh, many years ago, yeah. but now, I wonder whether oh, uh, you have seen some progress where people actually model the source that is close to the constriction of consonant production. Yes, so has that been yes, that has been done. So, as Lee's saying, the, the traditional really only looked at the vocal cords. But as we know, if you want to like a shh, sh, those types of sounds, those are all phenomenon that are sound sources elsewhere. Um, and so there has been some work done on that. There was some work done at ATR. Um, Cinder also did some modeling and that was done, the typical types of things done there are as the volume uh, velocity, as, as the air velocity gets over a certain threshold there's an assumed turbulence phenomenon. So it, it's, automatic. Yeah. it's automatic, yeah. So it introduces a white noise source effectively at this spot and because it's all linear you can sort of propagate it back and couple it with the original yeah. source. Yeah. At that time you have to turn off the vocal source. Uh, no, you can combine them together because it's all linear. You can just add the two. There's a frication source up here plus a, uh, a periodic excitation here. You combine the two together and then filter it, and that gives you a combination of frication and and vocal excitation. So like a zzz sound has both this and that. So that that's the kind of thing. So So by measuring what the constriction size is, if it's below a threshold and the velocity of the, the air, Flow in the in the model is about the thing. High enough to determine exactly what kind of. I mean, my understanding well, is like the ten years ago, when people tried to do all this and they all failed because the computation, the requirement for generating, you know, that kind of source is so stringent. Yes. If you happen to miss, you know, one millimeter, you actually turn off all the source. So you turn off the source, yeah. So the people actually advance. You know, like Things are advanced to the point where I believe we can we can get those phenomenon with the, the accuracies necessary. Because it is true that the tongue, um, for example, like a, a, an L, or um, let me think of a sound that's very, very close. Uh, well, the one I'm thinking is an R, a rolling R, like a rrrr. To get that sound is actually your tongue has to be positioned just right. And if it's off a little bit, You'll be like, and it, in fact, for people, it's also very difficult to get to that point without practice. And so to get that kind of accuracy, I believe we're at the point where we can do that. And you'll see in the models that we show the direction we're heading, and hopefully you'll agree that it's going that way as well. But right now, that source, that excitation modeling is still fairly crude. Um, and so that's one of the aspects where modeling airflow through the biomechanics um, hopefully will solve or resolve some of that. Otherwise, what you end up with is it's very, with, with these models, where it was, what I was about to say, these models, they work great for vowel sounds, right? Because this sort of is exactly what vowels are like. So you have this quite open airway, like a ah, uh, ee, ooh, ah. Uh, it's kind of like an organ pipe, really. And these models actually model that quite well. And so the vowel sounds sound pretty good. As soon as you want like a ul, oh, where you have two branches around a tongue that's kind of obstructing things, you've got these other weird resonance chambers, this doesn't actually work so well anymore. So to do um, consonant phenomenon, 
on frication and uh, um, uh, liquids and that sort of thing is very difficult with these, and they generally don't work very well, which is why this is not a viable method yet for speech synthesis. Um, however, let's, uh, so the state of the art, uh, there's this thing called Casey that came out of Haskins that's based on the Mermelstein model um, that has been tuned, and it does um, quite nice transitions and uh, diphthongs uh, uh, in the vowel space. And another model um, out of Rockstock University from Peter Burkholz um, is essentially this model where there, he does have a coupled, he has a lung model and the glottis model is coupled to the air pressure moving, the, mo the model of the air pressure moving back and forth through this uh, acoustic tube with a coupled nasal cavity. So it's quite sophisticated. It's still the, the linear approximation, but as it's tuned up quite well, I can play some of the sound for you here from, from Burkholz's. Ah, oh, e, e, o, u. So that's, that's, uh, that's what his sounds like. So we're actually working with him to couple what you're going to see today, some of the biomechanics, uh, with, with this so that at least you'll have um, a baseline of a uh, linear model that works. Of course, where we're trying to go is to model the, the airflow through this 3D vocal tract that will, um, through the aeroacoustics, get the excitations and the coupling and all the other phenomenon. Computationally much more difficult, but it should in the end be able to get the entire vocal range. So our approach, and this is where I'm switching off, so our approach um, is the understanding of uh, medical image data and collection of medical image data to derive our physiological or anatomical models, uh, developing biomechanical models of the upper airway structures, uh, developing aeroacoustics models so that we can essentially pump through air through the models, and developing a toolkit that allows you to combine the different approaches necessary in the same framework, tightly coupling the different models together so that they all work together to actually, in the end, produce sound. So I'm going to switch to John, who's going to show us where we are in our modeling efforts and our toolkit. And I'm hoping that we can go well, back uh, to the demo world here. Well, it's okay, actually. We, we can, I think we can... Well, I'm nervous that it won't. Okay, that oh, does work. Okay, well, we can... Um, well, let's go back to... Okay, back to the slides. PowerPoint, and then, and then when I need the demo, we can just put the demo up on that. Okay. All on right. that screen, I guess. Is the, I think they want the demo on that screen because it's because it, they're, they're doing a regular camera shot of that. Okay, so uh, good morning. Uh, so as, as uh, Sid was mentioning, um, uh, our task is to try to develop this uh, uh, full-blown articulatory synthesizer um, in which uh, the, the underlying engine is, is a biomechanical model and then we use that uh, as our means of, of speech production. Um, and in order to do this, uh, we actually need to create uh, an integrated 3D model of uh, the vocal tract, in particular the vocal tract components that are associated with speech, and then combine that with acoustics. So what that consists of, I mean, essentially you've got uh, the tongue, which is a very important part of this. Uh, you've got the pharyngeal wall, the, the throat here. You've got uh, vocal folds. You've got the hard palate, the soft palate, lips, uh, facial structures too, if you're interested in, in modeling uh, gesture and... and, and uh, and that sort of thing, uh, facial expression. And so you need a, a biomechanical model that, that combines all these things. Uh, this is a fairly, fairly ambitious undertaking. And so our, our uh, approach is um, to develop this uh, collaborative system called Artisan, which is uh, essentially it's a Java-based API for model creation with uh, GUI support for interactive editing, simulation, and observation. Um, and so why? Why Artisan? Uh, so, I mean, you, there are a number of existing packages uh, out there that do various aspects of physical simulation that could be applied to, to some of this. Uh, so, for instance, ANSYS, a uh, well-known uh, finite element modeler. There's uh, ATOMS, which is used uh, for mechanical simulation. Uh, there's Maya, which is uh, used in the animation world. Uh, th these are uh, well-known packages. There are a whole bunch of, of others, uh, but they all tend to have a very specific focus. So they're all designed to solve a particular problem. Uh, and uh, it, when you're actually doing the sort of work that we're doing, which is fairly cutting-edge type stuff, uh, you often need to get under the hood. 
and uh, put in your own algorithms and do your own experimental work. Uh, in order to do that, uh, we, we believe it's actually best to have some sort of an open source model and then people can kind of mix and match different results. Um, and the other thing, uh, we, we need to combine uh, integrate these models with acoustics, which can actually be rather uh, problematic. We also, uh, if we do aeroacoustics, we need to integrate that as well. Um, so uh, the interoperability of, of the, some of these existing models is actually highly problematic. Um, and also by producing this sort of open source platform, um, it does provide this um, a place for, for collaborative research. Uh, so I mean, if, if someone actually comes up with, hey, you know, I, I have a, a a good uh, tissue model, a good finite element model for, uh, for the tongue, say. Uh, well, the proof of that is often actually in the source code, right? The, the details is often, the devil's in the details in these things. I mean, you can publish a paper, but if you actually don't have the, uh, the code available, well, sort of, uh, it provides a way in which other people can, uh, for, can first of all use it for their, own, for their own purposes and kind of test it out and, and repeat uh, experiments and that sort of thing. So we, we believe that uh, an open source model is actually the way to go here. And, and so this is what we've um, done. So Artisan, uh, specifically, some of the features that Artisan provides, and, and I'm going to go into some of these details and, and we'll give some demos of, of the system. Um, so as a, uh, at the lowest level, there's a Java uh, API for creating anatomical and acoustical models. So Java is, a, is the base programming language for this. And we chose Java because it's uh, mainly because of uh, system interoperability. That's quite portable. And it, contrary to a lot of existing belief, it's not actually that much slower than a traditional compiled language. Uh, if you sort of code correctly uh, and take advantage of, of the hotspot compiler, uh, your Java code will run you know, one and a half times uh, uh, real time. It might even run as fast as, as compiled native code. Uh, so but speed is not really too big an issue. Um, <coughs> Artisan provides uh, a, a number of existing components for uh, well doing some finite element modeling, rigid and articulated bodies, springs, constraints, collision handling. I will show you some examples of that. Uh, it also provides as an emphasis on interactive simulation control and editing. So this, I, when I say interactive, I don't necessarily mean real time, but I mean interactive in the sense that someone can sit down, play with the model, set it up, uh, control the inputs, and then see, sort of see what's happening without having to like go and get a coffee and come back and see how the you know see how the job ran. You can actually sort of play with it online, and uh, and this is this is we think quite quite valuable. And so a lot of it, our emphasis is, is on trying to do this. Even, even if it's a, a situation where you, you have a course model that runs interactively and then you want to, say, get higher fidelity results and then you could run that slower. I mean, that's, uh, but we think the interactive uh, control part is, is important. Um, and of course, then there's, there's various acoustical uh, uh, tools, which, uh, uh, acoustical models, which we, we connect to this. Okay, so a little quick outline of, of the rest of this talk. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, uh, first of all, I'll give a quick introduction to so the architecture of, of Artisan itself. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how it's set up to uh, do interactive simulation support. Uh, this idea of a, uh, so we want this open source framework. Uh, so a lot of this problem just comes down to creating some sort of modular biomechanical simulation framework and, and a way to uh, some sort of general structure in which you can combine all these different kinds of biomechanical models, uh, which is not completely trivial, but we think we've uh, made some good progress in that. And then we'll, we'll give a few examples of, of some of the, uh, the ma major models we've actually done. Uh, when I'm talking about this, I'll, I'll give some toy examples just to kind of illustrate the, uh, the capabilities of the system. Uh, and then finally, I'll, I'll turn the, the talk back over to Sid, and he'll talk a little bit more about uh, the acoustical modeling. Uh, sure. Maybe the right time just to clarify yes. uh, the terminology. So here, yeah. by acoustic modeling, you mean how to generate acoustic waveform from whatever geometry? Sure. That you create. Right. I mean, essentially, uh, like the, the, there's sort of two parts to the system, right? So there's the there's the biomechanical model, or it's your vocal track model, and uh, this has got the tongue and the jaw and the uh, you know the, the airway and uh, the, the air chamber. And that moves. It could be driven parametrically. It could be driven dynamically. Dynamically, say, in response to muscle activation, that sort of thing. Yeah, so for those people who are viewing that from PC, uh, from their own PC, uh, we use acoustic modeling so pervasively here. Simply that the meaning of acoustic modeling here simply means that how you build distributions out of acoustic features. So it's a very, very different concept. Right. 
Um, okay, so um, our first kind of uh, objective is, is uh, to create this, uh, this open source system, uh, and it's essentially a, a hierarchical component-based architecture, and I will uh, give some slides to kind of illustrate that. So at the, at the heart of Artisan, you, you've got this hierarchy of, of models and their components, and, and as I mentioned, these are all implemented in, in Java, Java classes. Um, and then uh, they advance in times as a simulated uh, simulation system as a scheduler that controls the, the dynamic advancement of these, uh, of these components. Um, and then that's all under the control of a, a, a user interface, a graphical user interface, and a timeline component, uh, which I'll give you an example of. Um, and uh, this allows the, the user to, this is where the user interactive control comes in. And you can also set up uh, uh, streams of input data which can be used to control the simulation, and you can then uh, specify certain aspects or, or certain properties of the simulation that, that you want recorded. So th th there's this mechanism for basically input and output data streams, uh, and these are called probes. Um, there's, uh, of course, support for graphical and acoustical rendering, um, and the whole thing is enabled by a, a rather large, at this point, uh, a library of support routines that provide numerics, geometry, dynamics, collision detection, that sort of thing. Um, and again, these are all implemented uh, in Java. Okay, so when you actually, what you end up with, uh, you create your, uh, your, your model and it, essentially there's a hierarchical uh, model of these components. Uh, for instance, here you get a mechanical model and it might have a couple of rigid bodies and there are muscle components and then there may be points on, on, the, on the rigid bodies to which uh, the muscles are attached. Uh, over here we, we, we can have an airway model, these things interact. Um, and so essentially the, the, this hierarchical component structure. Um, so a little bit of, uh, a little bit of UML. Uh, so underneath, uh, the, it, all the basic components in Artisan are instances of something called a model component, uh, which uh, provides uh, methods for a name, or they selected index values, parent. Um, th there's a, a special case of this is a dynamic component. The dynamic component is a component which actually has state. So when a component has state, that means how it advances in time is actually a function of, of the inputs plus its, its current state. Um, so in order, to, uh, in order to set the model uh, at a particular point in time, you need to save and restore state. And so dynamic components provide that. Um, there's also a composite component, which is simply a collection of, of other components. Uh, and then so the, the collection of all this basically allows you to implement a component hierarchy. And a particular kind of component uh, is a model. And a model uh, is uh, essentially the, the main thing that the scheduler advances through time. So a model component has an initialized method and it has an advanced method. And the advanced method uh, is used by the scheduler and it says, I want you to go from this time to this time, and then the model takes care of that. So models are responsible for sort of doing their own internal simulation, whatever they have to do for, for the dynamic advancement. Okay. Um, now, uh, and then these are all, uh, a whole collection of these models are combined together under a, a root model. You saw that, the, the thing in orange in the previous slide. Uh, so you have a, a, a full-on hierarchy. The scheduler controls the advancement. Uh, it looks through the, the component hierarchy, finds all the models, uh, determines the next time event that we have to advance to. That's, con uh, that's determined by, uh, say, the, my basic frame update rate or, or uh, the next point at which I want to uh, sample some data for my output. The scheduler then tells everybody to advance to the next time event, and, um, and, and this is how the, the simulation is coordinated. Uh, there's also support. Components have, have to have uh, implement methods for reading and writing themselves from text stream, streams. So uh, uh, this is essentially the mechanism that we use for persistent storage. Uh, say we have a rigid transform 3D component, this would be a string representation of it, or spatial inertia component. Uh, and since this is all hierarchical, each component is responsible for reading and writing itself. These, this leads to a recursive file format here. So, 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 yes? So, so, so for the component, you mean if you take the time part of the model, or draw part of the model, and call this part of the model, are they belonging to different components? Or, or is it? Oh, so, uh, how, how do you organize different parts of the organs in terms of the model? Okay, so, um, just so are, they, are they different states? Or? Right. Okay. So I mean, you, you, you actually so, so, so everything everything is part of the same hierarchy. Uh, you can put different models into the 
into the hierarchy. Uh, so uh, in the jaw model, actually, I, I think I, I can answer your question when a little bit later when I give an example of the jaw model. And then I'll say, okay, this is a this, and this is a rigid body, and this is a spring, and okay. So we'll, uh, I'll just kind of move on here. Okay. Okay, so um, that's, uh, that, that's kind of the basic structure. So this is a component-based uh, structure with some fairly general interfaces defined, and then uh, all of the components that are implemented have to sort of conform to that interface, and then you, 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 can, you can do a lot of different things with that. Um, so uh, we also have uh, an emphasis on support for interactive simulation control. Um, so that is based on the, uh, on the concept of properties. Um, properties, uh, this is a little, bit, a little bit similar to Java beans, actually. Uh, and so the idea is that any particular component, in this case uh, I'm talking about, say, just a particle, and it can export certain properties that can be uh, uh, either observed or, or set by, uh, uh, by the rest of the program. So it might export things like its name, its mass, the external forces acting on it, the render properties, et cetera. There's a list of these things. Um, and the idea with the property interface is it provides a certain amount of information uh, about this so that it's very easy uh, for uh, uh, the GUI software to kind of hook on and to uh, automatically generate uh, interaction tools that allow you to kind of set and manipulate these properties dynamically without the user having to write a lot of boilerplate code. Um, and then we have some examples of that. So now we have to go back to the, uh, to the, to the, the split screen. So I think we're going to put the demo here. And now I'm going to okay. over, over okay. here. So, um, so a couple of... Um, couple of particular examples of, uh, um, of what we actually have, uh, and I'll talk about each of these. So, so we have this uh, idea of a timeline, um, which is a, um, uh, let's actually do, how am I going to do this? Okay. I, I have two of me now. I'm here and I'm here. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll, this is a very simple toy model, right? So this is actually artisan. This is everything, this is running in real time. Uh, so we've got this demo running here on, uh, on Linux. Am I allowed to say that here, actually? Anyway. Um, so this is a, a very simple mass spring model. Uh, and we will use some of these toy examples just to kind of illustrate some of the ideas. Um, so Sid's just going to start, start this thing running. So we've got some masses and springs here. Uh, this uh, particle there sticks. This whole thing's just going to fall under gravity. So it's your basic dynamical simulation. Uh, you can stop it. Uh, and then you can kind of reset this. Um, but if we want to do, um, so now what we're going to do is I'm going to give you an example of, of how we can interactively control this model. Uh, so one of our main components for doing this is um, something known as the timeline. So timeline, this is similar, uh, this is inspired by the, the timeline that you see in movie editing software. So the idea is you, can, you, can, you have a number of tracks here, and you can ar or arrange for, for certain input and output probes, we call them. I have a slide about probes over here. Uh, a probe is essentially something that, uh, at the most general level, a probe is just something that gets applied uh, as time advances. Uh, and in particular, we use that to, uh, to simulate, uh, to connect uh, streams of numeric data to drive the model or to log numeric data as the simulation pro progresses. So the input streams are known as numeric input probes, and the output streams are known as numeric output probes. So I'll give you a couple of hard examples of these right here. So this, um, this probe at the top, uh, you can actually open this up, which Sid has done. So this is a, basically a set of input data. Uh, it's basically three, uh, uh, three x, y, z values. Uh, this is actually read in from a file. And I want to use this input data to control the position of this particle right here. So you can set up that. Um, you set that up. And then down here, this guy in red, we're going to open that up. Oh, there's nothing there yet. That's an output probe. I'm going to use that to log the position of this particle as the, as the simulation progresses. OK, so you can actually do this. And you can, uh, the probes have been activated now. So we're going to run the, run the simulation. And now this particle is moving in response to this input, uh, this input data here. So this particle is now being driven. This guy at the top is now being driven parametrically. So, so the input is the force. The input in this case, the input, uh, well, that's a good question. It, it actually, in this case, the input is position. You could be force. So, so yes, yeah, so you've hit on kind of an important point. So uh, actually, in the, um, <clears throat> in, the, uh, in the biomechanical modeling world, and actually particularly in the, in the speech synthesis world, an awful lot of data is, is positional. 
right? So because what happens is you, you, you go and you, you, you do some experiments, you, you uh, use some medical imaging, you say, oh, I know that the jaw is in this position, or I know that uh, this particular uh, uh, system moves in this way. So I actually have trajectory data. Uh, and often it's actually the, uh, position, uh, the, the input data or the force data that's unknown. So when I say input, I just mean input that's controlling the simulation. That could be force-based. Uh, or it could be uh, it could be position based, and I'll talk about how you switch between them actually. And the hope is velocity. Yeah, yeah, it could be. That's right. right. Yes. The, whole, the whole purpose of the muscle model is that you can represent the force explicitly. Right. The muscle actually give you. The oh sure. Force. Oh, oh, use that the muscle model. Yeah, we do that. We do that too. Yeah. Sure. So, so what's the output here? The output here that's essentially X Y Z data for uh, okay. the was that particular particle. So the idea is you you can go and you can select. Uh, you can select these different aspects of the system uh, and you can say I want, I want to attach a probe here, I want to attach a probe there. Uh, so the probe stuff right now, uh, so the timeline, uh, we should actually talk a little bit more about some of the features of, of the timeline. Uh, so this is quite a, uh, this is a fairly simple example but just illustrates the point. You'll see a more complicated timeline when I show you the jaw model. Uh, so you can, you can move these things around, uh, for instance, like you can take the probes, you can kind of uh, put them in different ways, but one, one of the, um, um, actually, do you have the, uh, do you want to do the, do we have a, a simple example with a number of different, different channels? Channels? Yeah. Uh, can bring up a Well, channel. we've got the jaw model, yeah, the, we'll, we'll the, the face the model, you want to do the face model? Face model. This is a simple parametric face model uh, by uh, well, it's just one probe, but I mean, it's, it's essentially, again, three parameters also, which are controlling the, uh, this face. So this is a, a, a principal component analysis of the, of the face. Again, it's just a parametric model. Um, so we, we have this ability to, uh, and we thought fairly carefully about this idea of combining parametric and dynamic models, right? So you've got things that are controlled positionally, and then you've got things that are, that are controlled dynamically in response to force. And, and so the, the biomechanics part of that has to address that. Okay, uh, so actually, so we'll go back to this guy now. Uh, I think we're, yeah, we're probably done. So a couple of other things um, we can do um, is we can actually go, so, so I mentioned the, uh, the properties that all these components have. So uh, we can actually go and sort of interactively change properties on the fly. So for instance, uh, you can pick a particle, uh, say this one down here, and uh, pull up its, pro uh, yeah, you can edit, there's a set of properties. These are the exposed properties that contain the position, velocity, force. So Sid's going to, he's just going to increase the mass of this kind of on the fly. So it, was, it had a mass of 20, now it has a mass of 200. We play this, we probably want to mute these guys maybe. Turn off those probes. Yeah, okay. So now this whole thing's a lot heavier and it's going to sink down a whole lot faster. Um, okay, so we could... Okay, so we can stop. We, we can also change. Uh, we, we can change the rendering properties. Uh, so actually, there's, there's a, uh, some attention to visualization. We can select a, a few of these things, edit their render properties. I want to make these guys say purple or something or some blue, blue. Pick a nice color. Okay, All right. <laughs> there we go. Okay, fine. So it's just this interactive um, framework. Um, and we can. The other thing we can do uh, is we can actually do geometric. Uh, uh, so we have some geometric transform controls here. So you can take uh, this uh, particle here. It's, it's actually inactive. It's parametrically controlled. I can actually uh, uh, hook that up to a translator. And now we can run the simulation and I can move the translator around and so I can actually interactively play with things while the dynamics, while the rest of the dynamics is, is going on. So you want to see how, how if, if something is, uh, is positionally controlled, how it, how it interacts with uh, the remaining, uh, with the dynamic system. Okay. So, right, so again, uh, so these components, uh, as we just showed, so there's the timeline, there's various control panels that you, uh, w which you can control the exposed properties, uh, and there are these transformers. Um, and all of this now uh, sort of works in this context of this, uh, this modular biomechanical simulation framework that we have. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'll have to talk to this slide over here uh, because we'll be doing some demos over there. Um, so a, a big problem in, in this game, and, and this became apparent to us a little bit more as, as we started getting into, into the nitty gritty, uh, you have a lot of different kinds of, of models uh, that you have to hook up or different types of components. So for instance, uh, you've got rigid structures, 
Uh, you've got deformable uh, tissues. Uh, you've got, say, muscle-activated uh, tissues. You've got maybe uh, simple spring models that are used to, to implement uh, as an abstraction of some kind of muscle. Uh, and you need to hook this all together and in, in some sort of unified way. And it can be actually hard to make these things all work properly. Uh, so we wanted to abstract, uh, create an abstraction that was general enough that, that could encapsulate all these different behaviors. Um, and so in order to do that, um, we kind of went back to the, to the basic biomechanics and said, well, all of these things actually really just are, uh, their dynamic behavior is just a manifestation of a general second order mechanical system. Uh, so, I mean, this is F equals MA from, from physics. Uh, from basic physics, except it's F equals MA for, for grown-ups, actually, because everything is vectors and matrices now. So, um, so this, this is your, your mass, this is your acceleration, this is your force. X is your, your composite state vector, uh, or vector of generalized coordinates. Uh, and um, uh, so the, the main ob objects that we have currently are basically particles and rigid bodies. Particles three degrees of freedom, a rigid body has six degrees of freedom. Uh, we could extend this to have, uh, say, a reduced coordinate model of, of uh, say, a deformable system or something like that. But mo everything you see is currently composed of these fundamental components, particles and rigid bodies. Uh, but this is extensible. Uh, so you, you take all, yes? For the time, you couldn't do that. Well, it has to be, I mean, just not rigid body. No, no it's not. That, that's why it's made of particles. Okay, so, and then you, you model interaction between different particles. That's right. That's right. Uh, now, you could take, uh, you, you could sort of distill this down and say, well, actually, there, there's this tongue in it. And then, so the tongue model you're going to see has about 1,000 particles in it. Okay. So that's really 3,000 degrees of freedom. Uh, that's quite a lot. Uh, you could say, well, actually, uh, I'm going to run some principal component analysis on that and distill that down to maybe 30 important degrees of freedom. And then you would get a reduced coordinate model. Uh, this is something we're, we're looking at doing, and it simulates much faster. That's, this is basically the idea of modal analysis, and people in, uh, it's actually been around for a long time, ever since people started working with finite, uh, finite element techniques. Uh, so you could do a, you could put a reduced coordinate model into this so that it would be fine. Uh, we haven't actually done it yet. Um, so, and then you, you have your, your basic, your mass matrix now. Uh, it's typically diagonal, but does, it's diagonal or, or it's at least block diagonal. Um, and over here is your generalized force, which is a function of the positions of, of everything, positions, velocities, and the time. Okay, so this thing expands out into uh, more or less elaborately as, as uh, it's... Uh, depending on, on the components, but, but the basic structure remains the same. And in order to do the dynamic simulation, you simply you solve this equation. And you solve this equation by integration. Uh, so basically, uh, I, I want to update, uh, I have my acceleration. I use that to uh, solve for my velocity. I simply integrate the acceleration, which is essentially integrating uh, the acceleration is determined by the force times the inverse of the mass matrix. And then position's even easier. I simply integrate my velocity, which I've computed here. So, uh, of course, we don't do this in continuously with, with an analytical formulation. We do this numerically. Uh, so there's a whole, of course, there's an enormous body of literature on how to, how to solve these ordinary differential equations. Uh, the simplest way in which you would uh, you solve this system would be to use something called, say, a forward Euler uh, a forward Euler integrator. So now if, if I have a velocity at a particular time i and I want to find the velocity at time i plus 1 and I have some time step, that's h, uh, I just take h times the acceleration plus the current velocity gives me my new velocity. And then the, the acceleration again is given by the, the mass matrix, the inverse of the mass matrix times the force. Okay, that's easy. It's come basic. Back to my earlier question. Yes. For mass, I agree. I mean, you take measurement, you know what they are. But for force, how do you generate the force? I mean, if I give you a sequence of phonemes, for instance, you want to synthesize the sound, how do you determine the force? According to this procedure, you need to know the force in advance before you can integrate them. Oh, sure. How, so how, how, how is force computed to begin with? Oh, okay, so, well, force, it, it, uh, essentially, like, if you were saying, uh, I want to produce a particular motion, I would do a full dynamic simulation, then I would probably start with muscle activations. Okay, so muscle, act or, or neural activations on the muscles, and there would be some translation. Yeah, we know that, but, you see, there's one thing, so one, one aspect of, uh, one direction you can do, once you have this, this is a forward model, 
Right, so given the force inputs, what are the outputs? But you can also invert these models as well. The whole thing is important is that you specify the phonetic sequence, and from that you get to look at the table to show what sound will correspond to what kind of right. You would need you right. Know? I know that. Yeah, uh, so exactly how the force right. so is specified from there's, that. There's two approaches, right? One is the uh, measurement approach, which is actually what we're using to derive a lot of our models. It's contact dependent one. Right? Different yeah, it, then you might as well do, it's like time domain data, right? So you're essentially getting people to um, come, you know, say things and measure their actual activation, which is hard to do, but it's a good, you will definitely need to do that for validation. The second way of doing it is through inverse modeling, right? So you have your acoustic waveforms that you want to generate, and then you essentially propagate that back through the forward model to derive the the control parameters for the model. That's in the training, and you store that result. And then you and store that result. Yeah. And the theory is, with a forward model like this, that captures all the co-articulation and all the all the constraints of a of a um, of a the actual biomechanical system. Then interpolation in that space and changing of muscle activation in a space can be done uh, algorithmically in a way that makes sense. Each particle, you got 3,000 particles. Um, well, these are, this is showing them all uncoupled, but actually they would normally be coupled. So, so, so a force on a given, yeah. So force on a given model will propagate and be connected to your, say, your biomechanical model, like your jaw model. So, even though there's a single muscle being activated, it's actually exerting forces all over. Plus, when there's collisions and there's other forces, and all those combine together into it into this matrix. Well, you ultimately get, I mean, you end up, I mean, force can arise from, uh, first of all, the state, right? So just, if, if, if I stretch the deformable body out, then I get internal restoring forces, right? Uh, regardless of any external stuff. So that's how force is dependent on position. It can be dependent on time. That's external inputs coming in. I, you know, I just decided that there's this uh, neural activation that's changing the characteristics of the system. And it can also be dependent on constraints, as, as Sid mentioned. And again, that's all part of the, of the whole system. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. That backward inference step, I mean, yeah. that must be incredibly hard, right? I mean, that's because... going to be a whole research project on it. Have you started Act doing Actually, that? we... We I mean, have done some some starting point on that. Because uh, presumably it's at least as hard as any sort of hidden variable problem, right? Yes. With yes. EM and Yeah, it's uh, exactly exactly right. So there's different approaches to try and get a hold of what that inverse is, starting as simply from a linearization of the forward model in certain areas where it behaves linearly to much more sophisticated machine learning techniques to try and derive that. Because this is, this is giving us, I mean, so far, I mean, this is a second order differential equation we're looking at here, right? That's right. And then you're then saying you've got hard constraints. Yeah. It's extremely complicated. It's well, hard constraints like? Well, like the teeth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but, but that, that's the body. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you'll see how it, it, works, like yeah, it works out. Like you'll see how it works out. It does. Uh, uh, yes, it's definitely a hard problem, but yeah. By having a, a good forward model, yeah. um, there are there are certain things you can then do to actually figure out what the inverse is. Um, but it, it is a challenging as, problem. As you could try to find areas where the model is behaving linearly. But that's that's the first simplest approach. Right. Uh, but others approaches are, um, and one that I I've, I've considered is using like an auto encoder method, where it's you know you're using this as a generative model of, mm -hmm. of your data. And then you you have another, effectively just as big inverse model, and then you connect these things together so that they essentially form a um, uh, an identity. How do you start okay. the inverse model? And that's the uh, by learning I see. data. Yeah. So um, using a, yeah, like a machine learning technique right. to do that, but it propagates through the four model. And especially if this was differentiable, then you would even have a you could use gradient descent rather than say some other more. Right. Sophisticated. So is this kind of book really published somewhere? Uh, it's work. Yeah. Well, the inverse work. I mean, the stuff with autoencoder that was some stuff I did a long, long time ago. But other people have been working on exactly that problem, like Michael Jordan's, Michael yeah, group, and um, Quato uh, has also worked on some of that with the so not not in the articulatory domain, but in in um, the general, yeah, general motor. 
control domain. So, so there has been work on that. That's not, we're not at that point yet. We're trying to argue that getting a good forward model that can be validated using medical data, because that we have. So we can say, yes, this is the right, this actually is in the, the right sort of realm of um, physiologically accurate data. Um, then when you start to do the inverse, you, you know where the problems are if it's not doing it. You know, if the jaw all of a sudden flies out or whatever, it's like, well, no, your control is not. So if you found out what things are important to model, even in just in the forward model? Um, I mean, you know, because presumably that's the... I mean, I agree with you. That I, I, I think this is the right way to go, but presumably the scientific content is in actually working out... I mean, there's a gazillion different things that might be useful. Yes. That's right, and, um, and that's where... And actually, presumably you've now got the tools to discover which ones really are. Right? That, that's exactly right. Um, I don't want to run out there, of time, yeah, because we have a lot of demos a, to show. There's but a question I, I want to answer that question. More interesting to me than seeing demos. Think that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, well, sorry. actually, sorry. well, when, when we get to the jaw demo, I want to use that example to, to um, yeah. answer that question, which is to say, the pathway, and this is why we want to have an inclusive uh, toolkit set, is that the people who know some of the answers to, well, how, how accurate those models, for models need to be, and for what purpose, tend not to be, tend to be the medical people. The people who have... All, all agreed, right? But yeah. Well, and so we have, it. you'll see in the jaw model, it has been fine-tuned to the point where it can do things like chewing and swallowing motions, which is probably beyond what you need for, for speech, but at least we know it has that fidelity. Well, and then we can back up from that. Maybe we should go there. Right. I mean, you <laughs> well, know, I can, I can try to sort of, okay. I can try to well, sort of expedite well, this actually. Just going through F equals MA. <laughs> well, it, this becomes important when we talk about tightly coupling. Okay, okay so right? I'll try that, to... That's where... Yeah, essentially. So I, I'll just try to... Uh, uh, Let's kind of speed this up a little bit. So essentially, uh, this is your basic forward Euler uh, method of integration. Uh, it, this is easy to do, but it actually turns out that it's typically unstable if the system is stiff. So um, you have to use, a, in that case, you have to use something called an implicit method, uh, which is, again, it's like F equals MA, except now you use the, the F at the next time step, not at the current time step. And uh, this is the basis of an implicit method. The problem with that is you have to estimate F at the next time step. You don't actually know what it is a priori. And what you do, you do that by using, a, doing essentially a Taylor series expansion of, of F. Uh, and then uh, you, you have assumptions about what uh, delta, the, the change in state and the change in velocity is. And then these things here are Jacobian matrices that show essentially how the force changes as the state changes. Um, and this leads to this general implicit formulation um, in which you, now you have a, a mass matrix and it's essentially been augmented now with this, uh, this Jacobian information and you end up with this linear system. Again, we're still solving for the velocity here at the next time step and now we have to solve uh, this large linear system where the Jacobian information is uh, integrated with the mass matrix and this matrix is typically quite large. Uh, however, it is sparse and it's usually symmetric positive definite if you're lucky. Um, Observations you have here. I mean, what, what, how do I grant? Is it all have a? Uh, my first house ever used to tie lead pellets to the articulators and measure those kinds of things. I mean, I would think that all these inverses would be a whole lot easier if you could actually observe a lot of the hidden variables. So, eventually, all of this is going to lead to the ability to tightly couple um, FEMs, rigid bodies. Um, so the particle systems, uh, all in the same framework, so that the data that the data that we have to measure are things like CT scans to give you very good uh, rigid body, like uh, bone structures, and MRI to give you the soft tissue structures, and those need to be combined together into the same framework. Together with the acoustics. Well, the forward model is what does the linking to the acoustics. So we have the say the static. Static geometry. Let, let's take a simple case of static geometry of an MRI image uh, of a vocal tract, so that we get the air cavity, uh, and then that's combined with, say, a CT image, which gives us the jaw, because you don't see the jaw in the MRI image. So those two combine together, so you get a static um, airway, 
and then the airway allows you to simulate the acoustics, right? Presumably, you record the acoustics. Yeah, yeah, that, that's an output probe. Sure. And then match those two. Yeah, and then you match those two. Yeah, so you have both geometric validation as well as acoustic validation. And then people are also using, what do you call that thing that they use to look at fetuses? Um, ultrasound. Ultrasound. Yeah. ultrasound. We also, yeah, we also do use ultrasound, but that's very difficult to do the registration because ultrasound is not a very clean signal and it and it's tr it doesn't w deal with the translation so if your tongue moves forward and back like that that's not detected by ultrasound um, whereas and you, you can put some markers on there but it's still not a very clean signal and there's also a shadow there's a very big shadow in ultrasound right so you have any signal on the view I'm sorry do you have any observation of the velum any observation velum. the velum oh of the velum there, yeah, we do have some. Um, again, it's the MRI data that we use for, for that. Now, the problem with MRI data, while it gives these great soft tissue images, um, it doesn't run fast enough to give us any dynamics. So if you want to say like a, just a simple like eye, it, this, the sample rate is too slow to get all the trajectory information. So what you get... You, what, what you said actually was broken down just, I think, uh, last year. Uh, we actually have a, a talk uh, in about, I think next month we have somebody come here. They have very fast... Uh, yeah, so there's different... Well, the, the, so you, you don't get something for nothing on these things. So you can do fast, but then you tend to do a single slice or maybe two, three, usually three slices, mid-sagittal and one on either side. Then you assume symmetry for the rest um, and then you go back to the linear model. That's, uh, you don't get a nice 3D. So you can't tell like an L, the tongue moving and separating out. It just looks like a single <coughs> closed airway, which it's not, of course. Um, so that's the problem with MRI, even fast MRI. So some people use a strobing technique where you just go like I, 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 and then you're taking lots of 3D and then you piece it together. And that is another approach. And then you get the dynamics, but it's averaged over you know, some other thing. So getting the data from MRI, that is one of our main techniques, uh, but it has certain limitations, especially when it comes to dynamics. And so the forward model is trying to overcome those limitations in dynamics. It's almost like a keyframe animation, if you like. You have a, a good image here and a good image here and a good image here, so kinematically we know where it should be, and but we don't know the excitation, like the force profiles, to get them to go from one to the other, but at least when we do, say, an inverse model, we can actually validate at certain fixed points. So do you have something like degrees of freedom, or do you have some notion of how much data you need in order to make this work? Um, well, we don't have a quantifi quantified how much data we need. Like for the jaw, um, the amount of data, the, the CT scan plus the EMG, you know, the starting point for EMG, and then a lot of hand tweaking to get the chewing and the, the um, swallowing cycles get those accurate um, ended up there is quite a bit of hand tweaking because we don't have the inverse models but the hand tweaking is there to get to the point where we can be comfortable that those forward models really do simulate uh, human motion that they have the same ranges the same force profiles the same that we can measure and that's the best we're going to be able to do at this moment because we just can't put measurements into the right place all we have are kinematics all right, we can measure kinematics very well, but we can't measure force activations that well. So we, there is a fair amount of hand tweaking. So how much data do we need? Well, we need quite a bit of EMG, not too much image data, at least for the jaw, because the CT scan is so good. And then, um, uh, and then at this moment, still quite a bit of hand tweaking to do the geometric validation, or the kinematic validation. That's the stage that we're at with the jaw. The tongue, tongue's even harder to get activations. So it's purely kinematic. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna just quick uh, uh, what we can do. Oh, is there a thing there? Oh, <laughs> oops, uh, running out of power. Thanks. Sorry. Okay. Is that cool? So okay, I, great. I, I, so I'm gonna. Question here before you go. Ahead. I, while you're solving this, how do you impose the constraint that certain things can move? Yeah. If your time move going above the roof of the mouth. Or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, so I, the constraints. I, I will, yeah, I will that's. Talk about that, yeah, we'll talk about. But uh, I, I, I want. <laughs> well, I'll just say. Under cutter integration. Well, actually, the, the constraints, actually putting, bolting all this together actually isn't that easy because it's not, you know, uh, you end up with what's ultimately not a smooth system. 
Right, yeah, because so it's, in fact it's a differential algebraic system, and I didn't actually get into that in huge detail because uh, some of these slides were prepared for a slightly less technical audience. Um, but essentially you have this large, you do have this large linear system you have to solve, so we've paid a lot of attention to that. Uh, we use uh, direct solvers. Uh, we use the Pardiso solver actually from the University of Basel. We're also studying some iterative solvers. Um, so there's support for that built in. There are many other types of uh, solver types that you can have. Uh, so, you know, implicit, the various types of integrators, and, and we want to be able to set up the model so that they can support any of this. So you want, you want to use some, something with high resolution, so you can put a different type, integrator type. So all the mechanical models uh, basically support this interface, uh, which provides uh, the ability to set and get the state, and also get and set and get the information from which you can build those Jacobian matrices. And there's a little bit of intricacy involved in that, but it's, it's once all the mechanical models do that, then you, you can simply plug it into this unified solver and, and, and everything works fairly well. Um, so the, the basic kind of model types we have, there's uh, something called a MEC model, which is basically collections of particles, bridge bodies, springs, muscles, constraints. There's a FEM model, 3D, that's basically 3D uh, linear finite elements. We have that implemented. Um, and uh, MEC model is basically, as I said, it's a collection of, it's a hierarchical collection of, the, of these various components. It can also itself include uh, uh, FEM models. The FEM models, uh, uh, basically linear deformable material. Uh, we have a demo of this. I won't do it because we're running, we're, we're running out of time. Um, but using a stiffness warping method that's become uh, popular in computer graphics uh, lately, uh, where you correct for the, the distortions. Uh, there's get distortions here as, as the elements rotate. You can, co you can correct for that. Um, that's the math about the stiffness warping method. Uh, so MEC model and FEM model of 3D, they're all instances of this MEC system. You could create some other sort of mechanical model, and as long as it implements this interface, you can plug it into the solver and it will work. Uh, we have muscle. Why don't we show that one, actually? Bring up the muscle. Yeah. Bring up muscle. Okay. So this idea is a basic linear finite element model, and then we're going to uh, muscle activate it. And we do that by simply putting springs uh, introducing springs between the nodes here and, and exert a pull force. So you rotate that thing. Yeah, we don't need timeline on that. Uh, yeah, no, well, it doesn't really matter. Uh, so you can just kind of you can just kind of rotate around on this thing so people can kind of see what it is. Uh, so it's basically a finite element beam. Uh, and then I've got uh, some muscle fibers along here, up there. So it is controlling these uh, these controls and exposed on the control panel. And he's just activating that. The muscle. So this is not completely incompressible. It, this does compress, and so one of the other things we have to do is put in an incompressibility constraint. We're currently working on that. Um, so you can add constraints uh, into this formulation. You do that uh, at the theoretical level anyway, using the Lagrangian approach, right? So the uh, yeah, okay. So um, and we can do that for rigid bodies, for instance. We can bring up uh, what's the it's called uh, the third one down, Mac yeah. model demo. No. Oh, third one down. Right. Yeah, that one. So, I mean, this is basically I've got some, uh, uh, I've got a couple of rigid bodies here. I've got a joint constraint there. That's a bilateral constraint, unilateral constraint down here. I have a background in robotics, if anyone didn't guess that from this demo. Um, so these, these things all uh, work out fairly nicely in, in, in the wash. Um, and we also, uh, so this idea of uh, uh, combining parametric and dynamic uh, aspects of the model. So any of the, uh, the, the components, uh, the dynamic components, they can be active, in which case they respond to simply forces. They can be, uh, or they can be attached to another active component, in, or in which case they are actually slaved to that uh, component. This is how we connect a finite element deformable model to, uh, say, rigid body. So there's a demo called Fem Beam I can bring up here. Fem, uh, that's, sorry, Fem sorry. Block. Yeah. Uh, Right, so here I've got a couple of rigid bodies. I've got a, an FEM model uh, in between them, and the rigid bodies are connected to the particles on the top and the bottom, and it all works well. I've got this constraint there. Um, and uh, so again, there's a number of issues you have to pay attention to in order to kind of get this all to work properly. Uh, I can also then take, uh, I can take a particular particle, say, uh, in the, that FEM model, I can deactivate it. I have to, did you, yeah, edit, yeah. Let's make it inactive now, so it's now a response to parametric inputs. We can uh, play the thing, and now we kind of move things around, and yeah, so it all kind of works out nicely in the in the wash. Uh, and okay, uh, there is support for uh, collisions. So collisions, basically, anything you want to collide needs to expose a mesh. 
Uh, right now it has to be a triangular mesh, uh, and then we, we compute intersections to triangular meshes, and there's a whole bunch of literature on this. Uh, and then the intersection regions, we use that to generate contact uh, points. Uh, and then, so for rigid bodies, our collision detection is handled using impulses, right? So essentially you, uh, an impulse is essentially where you apply a correcting velocity to the, uh, to the system. Okay. I don't know how to play that, but just like that. Again. Yeah, it's a basic Whatever. impulse technique. So you do your differential equation, uh, that, and then there's essentially a projection technique. But there's a projection step in which you, uh, you correct. Okay, uh, collisions with finite element models, that's actually easier to do in some ways. Uh, we do that using a, a, a projection technique as well, uh, which I'll explain over here. So basically assume I've got this deformable body here. This is in green. I've got some sort of hard surface here. Uh, and there's been a penetration, this part in yellow. So what we do is we simply say, well, the, the parts of the FEM nodes that have interpenetrated, we simply project them back to where they should be onto the surface. And then the restoring forces... Well, that actually is generated by the FEM model itself, and then things work out. As long as you're willing to tolerate a little bit of interpenetration, then things work out fairly well. Right. So, okay. so, a couple of FEM models here, and then, okay. there's, a, and then there's another one. Uh, the oh, guy. yeah, where is that guy? That's uh, about mid midway there, right there. Oh, yeah. So this one, so here I have an FEM model up there. We can just play, yeah, just kind of. Now we're on your block, and now I can kind of move this guy around. So this is all running real time, right? So this is just playing with this. So, so, so this is kind of nice. The models are fairly simple. Uh, we get to a more complicated model. See in the middle, things, things run a little bit more slowly, but it's still certainly interactive. So, okay. So coming to dynamic jaw laryngeal or model. Uh, so this is a model that was developed uh, uh, mainly by... Uh, Alan Hannum, uh, who's a professor of dentistry at UBC and, uh, and a, a, a graduate student of SIDS, uh, Ian Stavnus, and they worked together to uh, use our to create this model. Um, so we can bring up the jaw model over here. I'll talk about it on some slides over here, and then we can uh, show a little bit of demo of it. Uh, so it uses a number of components. So it uses rigid bodies. Uh, there's muscles, basically linear point-to-point -point muscles, which are used to simulate the, uh, the muscle activations. There is some uh, deformable tissue, I think they put in down in the laryngeal structure. Uh, and constraints, so we have uh, uh, bilateral constraints here for the, uh, uh, the jaw connection of the mandible to the jaw, and a unilateral constraint for the teeth. And uh, we're actually, uh, we haven't actually done a full mesh-on-mesh -mesh collision, uh, but that's, uh, we're, we're going to do that soon. Um, Okay, so here's the, yeah, Sid is showing, this is actually the jaw laryngeal model, right, because we've got the larynx in here, that's, that's fine. Um, so uh, this, essentially, the, there was this process by which the geometry for this thing was extracted from medical imaging data, right, so you get your medical imaging data, and then uh, Alan Hannum actually did a lot of this work, and a lot of this was actually done manually, and so another thrust of our research is how to automate some of this process. Uh, there's a, a program called Amira that generates, helps uh, generate uh, segment, uh, the medical imaging data, um, and uh, that gives you, uh, uh, once the segmentation is done, then you can use another program called Rhino to sort of turn that into a proper mesh, and then the mesh can be imported into Artisanth. Once you actually have your mesh geometry, then the creation of a model, whether it's rigid or deformable, uh, the dynamic model is, uh, uh, is much easier at that point, fairly straightforward. Amira has support for uh, these things called landmarks, um, uh, which we can import into Artisanth as well. These are uh, uses uh, reference points uh, for observation or anchor points for, for muscles. Um, and so the jaw model, so then there was a, number, a bunch of work uh, that was done, and this, this part was done essentially manually by Alan, right? Uh, I mean, of the MG study. right, so he uh, knows, he knows exactly what the, uh, how the model should behave, right? So essentially what, um, what sort of motions we get um, um, in the in, uh, jaw behavior. Yeah, so, so, so one basic question here is that I think for physical modeling, jaw is important because it controls, it actually affects the, air, the area functioning in the muscle track. But right. linguistically speaking, the jaw doesn't specify any uh, phonetic features. Like Bell high, right? Bell high? Uh, was it Bell high? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. And you can get jaw like rigid and move the tongue height and get the vowel articulation. But I mean, in right. general, doesn't but the jaw move with vowel height? In, exactly. In general, this whole structure moves together. So when the tongue moves, you do get jaw opening. 
And so you need muscle activation to keep it stiff. If you don't want it to move, then yes. But if you just have it in normal rest posture, normal speaking, it will move. It, they all move together. In fact, the hyoid moves, the jaw moves, the tongue moves. They're all moving in, in concert. So it's, if you just had a rigid jaw with the tongue moving around, you're going to, again, not have all the range of vocal activation. Yeah. It depends what you mean by right sound, right? You will be able to match certain sounds, yes. But you probably won't be able to produce every sound. I know about people actually can bite a bar. That means your teeth essentially just control the jaw. But people can manipulate their tongue in such a way they can produce any kind of sound. Yes, absolutely. So somehow. Yeah, I don't know about any kind of sound. But like I say, you, yes, you can match you know, with a rigid jaw. But will you get natural sounding speech? Probably not. The dynamics of the articulation might depend on the dynamics of the jaw. Well, if I push my jaw, so you can produce intelligible sound. People actually do a lot. This is the way experiment people assess the same goal of production. And I think there's a theory of which I think Joe Pierre has been pushing on. People can manipulate the articulation in many different ways to produce the same kind of sound. Right. But yeah, that, that has yet to be control. tested, that, that hypothesis. But you know, the point about the rigid jaw is these muscles, the, the hyoid, the tongue is, is attached to the hyoid, the jaw is attached to the hyoid. All, so if you clamp the jaw down, now you've given a, a solid anchor point for the tongue to move. So you have activated the jaw in, at that point, so you, and you'll get certain characteristics of sound that right. way. So you can, I mean, we should just activate some of these muscles here. So this thing is, uh, I mean, this thing, this is, again, this thing's running in real time. So the various constraints are acting together here. So you can use this for, you know, right. So you these different controls, you can kind of play with the, with the different activations. So, so you can just physically moving the, the, the jaw around or something like that, right? Or uh, are you no, these are, are muscles. muscles. This is muscle. This is, these, these, oh, so actually, panels, yeah. these are these are muscle activations. Muscles. That's, that's, that's the digastric pulling. muscle. So yeah. I'm pulling, that's Very the, much like so. an opener. Are muscles completely disjoint from the muscles controlling the tongue movement? Or they yeah, right? There's no tongue in here right now. There is another model you'll see in a minute. You'll see in a minute tongue. with the tongue. It's a separate system. Yeah. Right. But it's not, they're coupled. That's, that's the challenge. That's why all that math is complicated because if it, they were decoupled, loosely coupled, then this would, would be quite easy to do it. But the problem is they're not, and you open this jaw, and it pulls the tongue, which then is attached to a hyoid, which then is attached to where the, the jaw t muscles are, and this whole system gets very complicated very quickly when you try to bring them all together. You can actually, if you want, you can take that jaw and you can, you can declare that thing to be inactive and then you can hook a geometrical drag around it. You can actually move it parametrically as well and then the rest of the system will kind of move around. But no, but the main emphasis on this is a muscle activated jaw. So, and it's essentially, essentially what are the, the critical activations, what are the critical muscles? And this is where, where Alan came in. Um, so this, this to date is so some, probably the most accurate jaw model including um, activations for chewing and swallowing. Oh. Yeah, so the, the over here there's just some, uh, some canned video. So this is a chewing cycle that we've done. So again, the, the various constraints working together, the, uh, particularly the unilateral constraint for the, uh, okay, have that for the jaw close. Okay, and, uh, so, and the, ne the next sort of thing is, uh, I'll talk about this quickly, is, is the, the muscle activated FEM tongue model. Uh, and this is based on work that we've done with ICP and Grenoble. Uh, so they actually had a, a muscle mo a, a tongue model uh, that they had simulated in ANSYS. It has about 740 hexahedral elements, and they identified 11 muscle groups within the tongue. Uh, and uh, so the purpose of this collaboration is to take their tongue model and then implement it uh, in artisan using some of our faster finite element techniques, and then we're trying to get this to, to behave with the appropriate fidelity. Um, and so, yeah, here we are over here. So the, um, again, this has about a about thousand nodes. It has about uh, 3,000 tetrahedral elements. Uh, the colored lines you see are actually uh, correspond to uh, muscle fibers. Okay? And so you've got the, the, the passive material properties, uh, and then the, the muscle activations can be controlled here using these controls. So we are playing now? No, we can play. Okay, so this does not run in real time. It runs about one-tenth real time. Okay. 
So, uh, which is, is still pretty good. Uh, and uh, the, the pulling from the stylate class. Right. So you can just hit. activate individual individual muscles here, and then get a get a particular response. At the yeah, that one. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Um, and so then this thing, uh, and so we have this deformable model. We then can connect it to uh, to the jaw model, which you saw earlier. And so we have that working as a as a unified whole now. So yeah, you can just bring up the uh, bring up the jaw tongue model. I'm excited there. Okay. <laughs> and jaw, jaw tongue, tongue it's model. Down. Okay. So these are getting more comprehensive models. Right. So now here, uh, here you have the jaw. We, we, this, the skull is not visible in this particular thing. So now we have the tongue. It's basically attached. And you specify attachment points between the, between the mandible and, uh, and also to the hyoid. So these are just nodes that are now made to track. And now, so it's an integrated dynamical system at this point. So you know, the tongue moves. That will cause some motion on the jaw and vice versa. Uh, so again, it's just they, under gravity right now. But if I uh, pull on stylate glossus, for example, you'll see the tongue and jaw apparatus move. But it's doing that through the coupling of the jaw to the tongue. And if I pull on the tongue, or sorry, on the jaw, let me just put that back, and pull on the jaw here a little bit, the diagastric muscle is a good one because it's very obvious. And that moves the tongue around too. So hyoid, tongue, all of this moves together. Right. And that, that's the complex forward model that we're talking about. So they're all coupled. And you, by biting on it, yes, that does decouple it. But that limits the range of sounds that you're going to be able to, to mimic or to, uh, to simulate, right. synthesize. So, yeah. Can yeah. you just tell me, have you actually managed to simulate speech? There's, there's some sound, yeah. Um, where do we have it here? That doesn't, we don't get the sound on this machine. The problem is it doesn't run on this laptop. Um, but do you want to just quick? Yeah, <laughs> there is sound that comes out. So, so with sound production, there's two complexities. One is um, getting the airway to derive an area function. We're, we have a three-dimensional, essentially, vocal cavity, if you like and translating that into 2D to, gener to drive those area function models, that we do, and you get some sound out, vowel sounds in particular, because it won't do consonant sounds. Doesn't sound that good, um, and that's why we're linking up with the people who have tuned those. But there's the question of whether the area function that's derived from this 3D thing into a 2D thing, there's a, there's a loss of information there. And so maybe you have the geometry perfect, but once you go to 2D, it doesn't sound right. Now, of course, you can adjust the 2D area function until it matches spectrally exactly whatever it is you want. But if you were to look at the, the actual corresponding geometry, it may not be physically realizable like, anymore. So you have this complexity of going through these 2D models that you can't tell exactly where the, where the problems are. So we're not sure exactly why the sound is so... Is, I mean, it's intelligible, but it's not high quality by any means. At least for some sounds, well, that's what—that's exactly what we're trying to do. So we're trying to look at the three-dimensional shape and do aeroacoustic modeling through that um, by looking well at this whole cavity. What is the filter function of that cavity without making a 2D assumption on that? And so that's a—that's the direction. Nobody's done that. No, it's not been done. Um, but given that we have that geometry, we could do that. In the RF domain, people do this yeah. regularly. <laughs> well, if, if for simple geometries, yeah, in music as well, you see it for various musical instruments trying to model the, those resonant. And so for simple geometries, uh, 3D geometries, like with pipes and stuff, it's, it's possible. But I don't think for a fully... Well, I, I haven't seen any... Basically, you're just solving a wave equation, right? So, you, yeah. So you can just use a lot of the stuff that people use for E and M to solve to look at in microwave cavities. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And there's been a, you know, there's an extensive set of tools and algorithms, and, you know, a, a huge tradition of that. Is, right. Is, is the dynamics of the vocal tract slow enough 
so that you can essentially oh, absolutely. I mean, static, sta sta statically yeah, solve the white question. Right. I mean, oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> that's so that's exactly, so that's, solving that's the, the 3D wave equation is a direction to go for sure. Um, there's also the sound. The, there, there's also the sound excitation problem inside the cavity, and that's the aeroacoustic issue, and that's also a direction which we are actively doing right now. No, the microwave. No, but there's a whole other branch of computational fluid dynamics. Plus, there's new methods that are coming out of computer graphics for doing those fluid simulation. They're much faster. That's what we're leveraging off of. Right now, we're leveraging off the 2D methods, but we know those are limited. We know we have to go to the 3D methods, but we're not, you know, these are the steps that you can see logically we're getting the biomechanics, so they're in good shape, so our geometries really are geometric, like we can compare them to our MRI data and say, yes, they really are within the right ballpark. We activate muscles, and they stay within the right range of human anatomy. So now we have shapes that we are confident are accurate. Now let's try and derive the aeroacoustics. What's the air sound? What's the air going to go through that? And around the teeth and around the vocal cords and then actually in the velum, that's another challenge. So that, we know what techniques we're going to use for that. And then the next will be, so, and that's still coupled to the 2D linear filter. And then we'll start to look at, well, now what's that sound propagation inside that cavity? And I actually think that's a slightly easier problem than the airflow. Yeah. Yeah. So. But you still have one more level, high level. Pressure. Yeah. Oh, even, okay. given the phonetic sequence, how you map that, that down to the control parameter. So eventually, the, eventually there will be articulations for all the different sort of, if you want to work at the phoneme level, there will be a mapping between phoneme and articulation parameters. Now, parameter. well, yeah, like the reason why I'm hesitant to say they're control parameters, some would argue they should be muscle forces or muscle activations. If you're in linguistics, there's a whole other body that says, no, they're, traject they're, they're endpoints, right? Well, yeah, I just need to know the, the, the endpoint configurations, and that's what a phoneme is. And then the muscle activation tries to reach that target, but based in the a given time constraint, it may not reach that target. And so other things will happen. So I don't want to say, oh, it's muscle force, because the, the linguistics people are actually arguing out about exactly this point. And these models could actually probably help to solve that question, that theoretical question. Is it, when we are doing um, speech, are we doing at a muscle control level or at endpoint control? Um, and that's still not known. Exactly. If we knew some of this stuff, and so this may answer that, and so then we may actually know that a good representation for phoneme are endpoints or are actual muscle direct endpoints with timing constraints, or are they muscle activations um, that are that are smoothed over time with some minimum energy function applied to them? So both of those are valid, and we don't want to say one over the other. We want to make sure our framework supports both possibilities. And that's why those probes can be force activations or kinematic activations. Uh, <laughs> so much for this. We're, we're, this I guess in, in terms of no, I, I, in terms of the, I, I'm not sure how uh, people's time constraints. So I, in terms of oh, the official time, we're technically out of time. We could uh, go on a little bit more. Uh, you want to show? I did want to show Deng's tongue model. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to suggest that. So this is uh, so. Um, so when we were down at uh, the speech uh, processing uh, workshop in Ubatuba, so John Wu Dang, uh, who uh, is, uh, said, "Well, can you know I, I like the the fact that your simulations run very quickly. Can you uh, can you make my uh, tongue model run in Artisynth?" And so we actually did this down there. Uh, it was pretty easy because it's basically uh, it's a mass spring model, so it's not actually a, a, a finite element model in the classical sense. He, he does his ele implements his, uh, elements with masses and springs. And we wrote a file importer. We agreed on a file format, and, and this is it. So this is running interactively here. So this is this is kind of useful for him. And so what he's actually done done now, he's got a student uh, back in Japan who he's asked to uh, look at kind of uh, continuing this work with Artisan and uh, and then connecting it to the jaw model. So again, you, uh, what you do is you just take, you just specify certain nodes uh, that you want to hook up to the mandible or to the hyoid or some other structure, uh, or to a, another finite element model for that matter, and uh, and then you have this integrated model. So, 
<laughs> uh, we didn't put all the muscle groups in there. He's got actually quite a large number of muscle groups in his, I think he's got about 30 or so. So we just did a, did a couple of them. Uh, again, these colored lines you see, these are the, the muscle activation lines. And they're, they're controlled by these sliders up here. Yeah. So, so we just put a couple in first. So I think what they're working on is getting all the muscles in there, the volume constraints, yeah. and then attaching this to the jaw. Right, because we have a good jaw model. Yeah. So the main, yeah. So the main thing is is uh, the volume. Actually, we're going we're to help them do that. We're going to put in the volume constraint. The volume constraint, uh, pretty important for doing tissue modeling. Uh, and so uh, there's actually someone at UBC who's uh, been doing some work in that in in implementing the volume preserving constraint fast. Uh, so we're going to put that, implement that in this model, and then also in uh, in the other deformable models that you saw. Yeah, and uh, I can't play some of the sound that we have. I mean, I have it on here. Well, you right? can show the. Yeah. You show the. You want to. Show, you want to show the airways of the, the idea or. Uh, some other yeah. Model. Old yeah. Model. So we do have a, a 2D airway model. All right. So this is a. But it yeah. doesn't. So I can't this is hear it on this machine. Kind of, I don't know so why this machine doesn't play the sound, but. Right. Normally, you would be able to. Uh, so there's a, so the the actions you see here are being orchestrated by the timeline. Uh, oh, I forgot that. I mean, you can actually so show up the timeline here. Oh. So there's, so there's, the, there's timeline. the timeline, right? So there's the timeline with different uh, uh, this top probe here, so you can kind of expand that. And that is basically a set of parameters that control the the 2D. So this is this is sort of a hybrid 2D 3D model. So you, you've got a 2D spline kind of Mermelstein style uh, oh. um, sagittal plane model. And then that's connected to uh, this, uh, this airway structure. So the airway, the, the 3D airway deforms just in, uh, in response to the, the changes in that 2D profile. So the, the profile position, that's just controlled parametrically by that top probe you saw in there. Or it can be controlled interactively here. And then there's other probes that control. That's the tongue tip, uh, right? Uh, that's right. Sure. So okay. It's not so realistic in all configurations, but. No. So, um, when you do the uh, the aeroacoustic modeling uh, for these two things, do you, do you what sort of boundary conditions do you use for the walls? Are, are they rigid boundary conditions, or are they you know <laughs> are they soft? Okay, so so, so the actual aeroacoustical modeling and stuff is just in terms of actually something like air air flow is something we're just getting into now. Uh, so the traditional but things are just simple transmission line models that you can get. Well, the f okay, so the source filter model is yeah essentially a, 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 trans a, a transmission line model which is modulated by the shape right. of so the airway. Flexion coefficients to uh, okay. derive from the shape. Right. Okay. Right. And now, uh, in in terms of what we're going to do uh, for doing the aeroacoustical modeling, um, uh, I think the first thing would be to do aeroacoustics and assume the uh, the shape is again rigid uh, but then yeah I'm just gonna have some so, some sort of absorption capability right. depending yeah, on its I local on, lo on its local stiffness yeah, I, right I suspect that you, you really do want to be a little bit more flexible about boundary conditions yeah. Yeah, that may be um, because the rigid boundary conditions are not going to be good and, and you really want to mix boundary condition and the, frankly it won't be any harder I think. So exactly right. It shouldn't be any harder. We have both soft and rigid constraints implemented. Yeah. So I mean, it's exactly those point is why we built this in a way that is like a toolkit, right? Because there are people out there, and the problem is there are people out there who really strongly believe rigid constraints, like for the jaw, for example. You know that the jaw is best represent this. The the condyle joint is a, is a planar constraint. And there's others say, no, 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 it's really got to be this. And rather than say it's one or the other, say, you know what, if we put them together in the same framework, you can tell what the difference is. But right now you see a publication and they've got their data and they, and they, can't, they can't compare very easily. I mean, this is just another example of the, you know, of the tube shape where you can play with the uh, right. tube shape. Normally it would be making sound. I don't know why this computer doesn't make sound and it doesn't run fast enough on that computer so it's like, uh, it doesn't keep up. But um, this would be an example where you can see the deformation of the tube. Um, so you can even adjust the length of the tube. This is something that's actually very difficult to do with the Kelly lock bomb method. It doesn't support changing dynamic length. So that's one novel thing that we have added is a different formulation of the um, linear 
linear approximation of the uh, uh, frequency response of the tube that supports um, non-stationary parameterization. So you saw the, uh, the word equation by time domain method or time yeah. domain method? Uh, this is a time. The one that allows that is essentially solving the Navier-Stokes, 1D Navier-Stokes equation um, versus kelly lockbaum which is like a transmission line. You know, it's the transmission line equations, uh, which assume quasi-stationary parameters. So, but I mean, that's a subtle difference. It's not, not yeah, that so, significant. So this, this system looks like it'd be really wonderful for general biomechanics, too. I mean, it's well, spider so, biomechanics. So what, is, what has also happened, is, and, and, and um, we have had people who have come in and said, oh, it, just that. And they go, oh, and can you do this? And, and so we start working with them. So like Alan Hannum in dentistry. So I kind of went off to John Model and ICP guys in Grenoble. And uh, there's a, a group also uh, at the University of San Francisco that's doing work in uh, uh, swallowing disorders and understanding the physiology of swallowing and stuff. So they're actually going to come up. Uh, there's a conference uh, related to that in Vancouver in March, and we're going to give them a little a bit of a show. So we, do, we have these sort of people who are coming in and saying, oh, this is very interesting. And so, you know, we, we like it to be useful, so we kind of work with them. And we have put a lot of, a lot of the emphasis has actually gone into the biomechanics uh, as a result of that. Yeah, but I would think that you know, e even outside of small the head, I mean, just just a biomechanical body. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. sure. Actually, this is why this is why we actually uh, well, I, I took some time to kind of put in all the the bilateral and unilateral constraints because you don't actually yeah you you can kind of fake that out a little bit with the jaw, uh, but someone's going to say, well, can you do a skeleton? <laughs> You know, as soon as you start to say biomechanics, you're going to want to have the yeah, whole right. dynamical the whole thing. thing. So we, we, yeah, we, we, we put that in. So some robotics, robotics research paper, uh, people today actually find that useful, that kind of toolkit, because, you know, they want to shake hands, you know, and talk robotics. Is that yeah, you know, woman simulated? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Robots are you could support that. Yeah, yeah. Could. you could support could. that. It's not, I don't they think could. it's that much of a stretch. I mean, what, what, what we're well, coming up with is that the realization of speech, I mean, kind of being yeah, so speech researchers. Talk about the difference between these kind of reaching tasks versus speech tasks. Yeah. So reach tasks, you always know where you want to go. Right? You know yeah, the goal, but, but, the but speech si people don't know. Right, but also the, you know, the robot systems are so small. I mean, small. you can just hack them together. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, so in dealing with the speech, the, the modeling of the speech phenomenon, by being able to do that, many other things are subsets of that, is what you're noticing, and that's true. So, so some of the same formulations that are here are more sophisticated than you probably need, but it will, it will do them quite well for some of the, the normal sort of robotics kind of activities that you want. They can, can be handled in there. And once you add airflow simulation in there, and, and, and so you have a, an engine that does computational fluid dynamics plus FEM plus rigid body all in the same framework, well, that doesn't exist in any tool yet. Uh, and we, as speech researchers, we need that. But for many others, they don't, they don't need that. They can very happily do an FEM in package A and then port it over to do their uh, fluid dynamic calculation in package B, and the fact that there's no interaction, well, that's okay, because they didn't need it. Anyway, it's an airplane wing or something, and they just assume that there's no interaction. But as soon as they're coupled, like they are in the vocal tract, um, you can't do that approach anymore. Uh, so, um, and so many other problems are subsets of this kind of thing. Now also balancing of a robot, you also, you know, if you do the robot movement, you know, the walking, you have to worry about balancing, otherwise it won't fall. Yeah, so that, that, yeah the control that problem is, is a so hard problem. It's different, problem. Yeah, it's different and hard problem. The control problem for speech is very, very challenging. That's kind of muscle. Um, exactly what kind of muscle activation you need to have in order to maintain that to maintain goal yeah. at the end. So which is not well specified to begin with. Right? Yeah, so you might think that so speech is very complicated, chewing and swallowing. Swallowing is a really complicated set of muscle activations. To get you know, just think about swallowing water, what has to happen, or chewing something into a thing and then the muscle the tongue has to pin itself up against the back uh, against the palate set up a rhythmic motion to push it through. That is so complicated, um, and yet it all interacts with the fluids and everything going on. So that's why people with interested in dysphagia type things are interested in this, 
because the same equations for speech and the same issues come up with swallowing disorders. Though swallowing has much higher forces. Speech is very light forces. Swallowing are these enormous forces that are opposing, so it becomes a very stiff system, where speech probably isn't as much. So I think swallowing actually is harder than speech in terms of modeling. It's more nonlinear. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and all the collisions. It's a hard phenomenon, which is also why if you can't swallow properly, you will you, you die. So it's kind of an important issue medically as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we do have some examples of sound. We just never got to them yet. But um, yeah, we appreciate the um, the feedback. And sorry that it was we, we didn't know the level of audience in terms of the mathematics. So there was a bit of an intro to some of the issues there. Um, but hopefully you get an appreciation for the complexity of the, the types of models that speech synthesis needs. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, all right, thank you.